Good. Uh, good evening. Thanks for hanging around for, for so long. And I guess I can talk until 6 because the conference dinner is at 6.30. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Jörg Hacker, I'm the uh, Director and Chief Scientist of Airborne Research Australia. Many know us, uh, we are an independent, uh, not-for-profit research institute and we fly little aeroplanes, just slightly bigger than drones. And uh, uh, it was really great to see the, the two talks before me because, I mean, you can do amazing things with drones, there's no question about it. But, but my feeling is that nowadays everybody thinks, well, it's either drones or it's sort of bigger aeroplanes flown by uh, sort of the big operators and things like that. But there is a considerable area in between and that's what I want to tell you. To do that, I first want to do a very quick run around the world and then come back uh, to Australia. So my talk is called Mind the Gap Between Drones and Traditional Airborne Platforms. So drones are on the, on the left up here. Oh, sorry. Are on the left here and uh, the traditional platforms are there and the platforms I'm talking about is all of this here. There is the one we are flying, there is one of a, a group we work together in Germany, there's another one in Germany, another one in Switzerland, one in the US and one in Canada. And uh, they all use sort of a thing in between the two. Um, I wanted to show you very quickly um, what, what they do, one slide sort of per, per organization. But first I want to say, because some of these aeroplanes look extremely fragile to some of you, um, they're not. We can unrestricted research flights operations anywhere in the world, day and night, over land and water, over urban areas, a thousand to two thousand kilometers range, six to, six to eight hours endurance. We fly these aeroplanes between 10 meters above the ground to seven kilometers flying altitude. We fly multi-sensors and to me personally the most important aspect of all of this is see with your own eyes, be there, not with machine vision. But that's my personal thing. And we use 15 to 20 liters of premium unleaded petrol per flight hour. So they are very economical and uh, can do just as magic things as other. Uh, that's what we've seen. Okay. Now, to show you that, I just uh, wanted to give you a few examples. One, and that's a few, ex uh, a few, quant a few um, sort of uh, field experiments that were done. And I can only say, try one of the following campaigns with either drones or traditional air airborne platforms. That would either not be possible at all, or it would cost you a small fortune. Thanks. So here's the first one. That's the uh, small environmental research aircraft of San Diego State University. And uh, that's in Alaska to study uh, fluxes, turbulent fluxes of CO2 and other quantities uh, over the tundra there. Now, how that was done? They, shipped, they took this aircraft apart, shipped this area from San Diego to Prudhoe Bay in, in um, Alaska, fly to Barrow, Alaska, 400 kilometers, and then fly long transects 10 meters above the ground, and then they process the data, take the aeroplane home in a ship. Try this with any other platform. Next one, that's our Swiss colleague, which is equipped with just about any particle and aerosol uh, sensor and chemical sensor that you could dream of. Uh, in two pods under the wings. Um, we worked a lot with that in Europe, but we will ship one of the pods to Australia later this year, and we will fly the largest ever methane emission study in northeast, northwest Queensland with two of the, these aeroplanes. That will be the largest ever flown methane campaign in Australia, funded by the UN for that matter. That's how it's done, but this time we drop the drone, you combine the small aircraft with the drone. The drone flies, looks at the small patterns, and the uh, Zera looks at the larger patterns. On the right-hand side, there is some results, but there's obviously no time to go into this. That's another one from Germany, where we flew thermal sensors in a gyrocopter, which is a very economical platform too. Um, 3D thermal infrared, which one can also in other ways, but this way, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than anything else. This one is a very exotic one, like it's a trike. Looks extremely dangerous, but it's not because uh, it has a parachute which brings the whole thing down if anything goes wrong, but we've never had to use it in the last 20 years. Um, we shipped the thing to Inner Mongolia, flew traverses there and measured for the first time uh, ultrafine particle emissions from a Chinese uh, power station that was about 50 kilometers upwind. So again, try this with anything else. Either you can't carry the instruments or you won't even get there. 
And this is sort of one of my adventures, which I did last year in August, September. We flew 7,000 square kilometers of mangrove high resolution mapping with LiDAR, aerial photography, and uh, NDVI, um, basically all around the Gulf of Carpentaria. And the uh, turn OSH cover was, uh, was mentioned before. The data from that is on the turn OSH cover per, uh, portal and can be downloaded freely, free for everybody. So that's a very unique data set. There's nothing like it anywhere. That was the end of my presentation one. I think I'm good in, pretty well in time. <laughs> now let's go to presentation number two. And presentation number two, and this is why I could roll them together, is really an application, again, a, a, a more explicit example of my, sort of which explains the, uh, the, the, the gap that's between the traditional platforms and the drones. So, when we were flying the, uh, the survey of the mangroves, Andrew Brooks from the Griffith uh, uh, Coastal Management uh, Institute rang me and said, well, you guys fly LiDAR, airborne LiDAR, high resolution LiDAR. We are spending weeks in the Queensland erosion gullies around the Burdekin to uh, determine the shape of the gullies because they had just received the Eureka Prize for judging the uh, uh, the amount of soil that gets from these erosion gullies into the Great Barrier Reef. Now, is there a better way to do this airborne? We've tried all sorts of things. We tried government LIDAR, airborne LIDAR. We tried drones. We tried phot photography and anything. And I said, well, let's give it a try. So on the way home from Burktown in, Queens in North, far North Queensland, we did a detour uh, to a place called Strathalbin, funnily. Um, as that's uh, at the Burdekin, and we flew our LIDARs in a very special pattern with very special instrument settings over that area. And here's uh, sort of the, uh, a bit of the story about it. Um, how can you measure the shape of the gullies and all of that? Well, the traditional method really is you use terrestrial LIDAR, and that's the thing on the, on, on the right-hand side here. And that's how it works. I mean, you have a an instrument that you put up somewhere and that scans around, but it cannot see through the walls of the gullies that cover the other gullies. So you only see line of sight. So to do that and cover a whole gully, which may be like one, two square kilometers big, you need to relocate this instrument and the reflectors 500 times. And you do this in a dusty environment, very steep hills, you can't climb them up. You have to lift the thing out, go somewhere else and so on. You get fantastic images like this is really, I mean, this is really uh, like, like nature, but it's extremely expensive in terms of manpower. So we said, okay, let's try some, oh yeah, okay, that, that's how it looks. I mean, that's what they've been doing for weeks and they didn't really like it that much. <laughs> that's the, the result that you want. So you, you do that once and then you do it a year later and then you take the difference and then you know how much soil is washed out. And that's what they got the Eureka Prize for. So the alternatives were standard airborne LiDAR techniques, like the LiDAR that is done by well, government, by the big aeroplanes and all of that. You get about 15 points per square meters from your LiDAR that looks down. At best, you can do half a meter resolution pixels uh, from a DEM, and that's how that looks. Well, that's not really a good representation of that gully. You can't really see a difference because it's very out of focus, so to, so to say. You can add um, the, the canopy height model, doesn't help you that much, so that's still, will, you, you will not be able to derive like what gets washed out when you do it next year. So the next thing they tried was drones, which could have been worked, and you actually get brilliant imagery, it's no question at all. So this is a, a drone photogrammetry, drone photogrammetry because I mean everybody knows that with using photogrammetry, you can do DEMs, very high resolution DEMs, in this case 10 centimeters, and also 1.6 centimeter photo mosaic, great, so that works, works really nicely. Um, or you can just extract the DEM on its own, that's sometimes better because you can, you can analyze that better digitally. So that's fine, that works. So fine, great detail, sufficient resolution, but there's one problem, or two in fact, Vegetation is a problem because you do this photographically, 
when there is trees in the gullies, you won't really see them because you do it on a photogrammetric technique and that does not see through the trees. Also, you basically do one of these erosion sites at a time because it takes you, you have to go there with a the car, you have to set up the drone, you have to fly the drone, you have to collect it and all of that. So it takes one site at a time. If you have a second site which is 50 kilometers away, you need another day and so on. So they were not really that excited about that idea. So then we came in and we discussed that and um, we developed our special methodology how to do this with our um, state-of-the-art big LiDAR sensor and uh, cameras and so on. And um, we found that it doesn't need a big bag of dollars, but only a small bag of dollars to do one of these sites. That they, the site is about two hours flying in this case, uh, where they spent two weeks before. And that is the result here. That's the result, also a 10 centimeter pixel DTM. And this one has now actively the vegetation removed because LiDAR sees through it. That's the image and if you just remember the one that I just, just showed uh, from, from the drone flights, the topography looks nearly identical, so the resolution is the same, except we have the small advantage that the, the vegetation is positively removed. Or, put it differently, we can also look into the structure of the vegetation. So we would see, I'm not showing this, we would see if we do a cross-section, the, the vegetation, the trees as they grow in these gullies. And that's another piece of really important information. So, to finish off, we defined an example task. So let's say we want to do 10 sites of 10, one square kilometer each, spread over a square of 300 by 300 kilometers. Two of them are near an airport. Two of them in, are in a very difficult area to access remote, this a very remote area where you basically can't drive to and so on. We want to map it once a year at 10 centimeter resolution. We want 10 centimeter pixel RGB imagery. And we want also hyperspectral data, preferably high resolution shortwave infra infrared. Now, how do we do this? Traditional airborne platforms, well, as we said before, point density is too low. Also, the big machines generate a lot of CO2 containing exhaust and they are noisy. We could use a helicopter because we can generate higher resolution LiDAR from a helicopter. That's rather expensive and the same applies to CO2 exhaust and pol noise pollution. We could do it with drones. Well, approximately, we, we, we probably need about two weeks, uh, not per site, that's wrong. Um, we need a day per site, if not more. Uh, it would be difficult near airports because drones in airports don't go well together and inaccessible sites also because you would have to be f to fly outside of range of sight and things like that. Vegetation would be difficult to resolve and so on and you couldn't carry a spectral uh, sensor, a reasonable one, unless you fly two drones or three. Ground-based, well, as we said, would take about two weeks in the, in the gullies. That's not what we want. If you use our technology, based on the small environmental research aircraft, it'll take you for the whole thing, all 10 sites, about one week, two competent people, and uh, low CO2 because of premium and leather fuel, and basically no noise pollution because these airplanes are extremely quiet. So we're gonna try this together with the, uh, with the group in Griffiths, and maybe next year I can report how it went. <laughs>